So the impact on the IT sector is the substantial impact ac across sectors. Uh, previously, the Security Critical Infrastructure Act focused on four asset categories of electricity assets, gas assets, water, and critical ports. Uh, it's been expanded greatly to 22 different asset categories in 11 sectors. Uh, the impact on the IT sector is one of those sectors is, is called the data storage or processing sector, and that's uh, associated with infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, and software as a service as critical assets to support other critical infrastructure sectors and, and governments. So the benefits for the public sector, or the reason why the public sector has been included, and that's government, state, territory, jurisdictions, and body corporates that are enacted through law in those jurisdictions, is that it's a matter of supply chain. So you're protecting the government business by raising the security bar for the cloud services that government is consuming as it moves towards the cloud for its various cloud and cloud strategies and initiatives across the, the st uh, Commonwealth state and territory governments. So effectively what you're doing is you're uplifting the security of the supply chain for cloud services, giving greater confidence and trust in the, in, in the consumption of those services. So the challenges for industry and, and IT sector is, is we are uh, effectively, it's, it's how heavily regulated we are globally. And there's various frameworks and standards globally that, as a, that the IT sector uh, uh, conforms with. The challenge, and the Australian government called this out, the challenge is making sure that you introduce regulations, but you don't want to, to, to uh, duplicate regulatory impacts. You want to regulate industries without making it too difficult or duplicating the various uh, th uh, things that we have to comply with. So they've been, uh, Department of Home Affairs have been very good in that regard, have engaged with uh, not just our sector, but other sectors, so that um, as they've designed the reforms, we've been able to tell them what framework, international frameworks and standards that we comply with, and they've recognised those as forming part of the certification or, or part of the, uh, 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 what we do as the critical infrastructure asset owner that meets the intent of the obligations that government are putting on us. Um, so uh, the challenge is not to have regulatory duplication, but the government is, is, is addressing that quite well in, in this regard. So under the reforms, both public cloud and secure cloud will be registered as, as critical assets. And they're registered, I say, on the basis of being in the supply chain of Commonwealth, state and territory governments, or in the supply chain of critical infrastructure providers where there is business critical data thresholds. The difference is even a public cloud critical infrastructure asset may not meet the security appetite, the risk appetite and the security requirements for particular customers. So for example, government agencies that require, uh, 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 operate with protected, government classified protected workloads, or for example, uh, energy utilities that for, under the terms of their license arrangements have very specific uh, uh, local, uh, local infrastructure, local workforce requirements. So the difference between the two is that a secure cloud capability is built to be certified and accredited to meet a, say, government in classified information protected workload and has greater uh, assurances around the location of the, uh, uh, the, the sensitive data on Australian soil and the workforce being predominantly Australian for critical employees being, being Australian uh, operating out of Australia. So that's essentially it. Even a public cloud asset may not be uh, quite right for the risk appetite of a particular uh, customer. It'll be based on, it'll be based from customer to customer. Um, it's, it's vital to have events like this because, um, I mean, we're engaged with the regulator, but, um, and the regulator is engaged with the state and territory governments. But this is a chance for uh, the private sector, who are going to be subject to these regulations, to engage directly with the public sector, who are uh, benefiting from, from the, the regulations. They're the reason, in part, why the regulations uh, exist. So it's, it's about building those connections between uh, peers, so uh, uh, the critic, the, myself as, as a someone who's 
the organising the regulate, uh, regulatory response within SAP, being able to connect with our customers who are going to be uh, consuming our cloud services and need that trust and assurance that we understand the le legislation, the regulatory requirements, and can work with our internal teams to make sure that those customer requirements are, are met and build that trust. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I do just have one more, more point just to note on the reforms. So the reforms uh, passed, the, the first part of the legislation passed just uh, on, Tuesday, on Monday, uh, as it were. However, they are still subject to the minister turning on the reforms, for turning on the positive security obligations for a particular sector or category of assets. So, and that's at the Minister's discretion based on the cyber threat she perceives to a particular sector or asset category at the time. So I just wanted to add that, that, yep. that point that they don't, it doesn't, legislation's not released and immediately we, we have these obligations. There is a process of turning those obligations on for, for, for the IT sector.